Well, this morning we're going to take a look at a little book called 2 John. We're going to turn now to the Word of God and hear the Lord speak to us. Some of you will remember that uh, several years ago we walked through 1 John together. I can't remember how long it's been. It's been a number of years. And Megan, uh, my wife, will soon be walking through the letters of John with some of the ladies. And again, more on that to be to be uh, revealed. If you're a woman, I hope you'll join her for that study. You can get more information about it in the back. Second John is a very short little book written by the same guy who wrote the other letters of John, John the Apostle. Those of you who are familiar with 1 John will immediately recognize John's style. John has a very distinctive way of speaking, and you'll pick right up on it as you read 2 John. But if you would, turn now to 2 John. It's going to be on the screen. It'll be in your bulletin. It's on page 1214 in your printed copy of God's Word, in your pew Bible there, page 1214. And while you turn there, I want to get you thinking for just a moment. As we enter a new year, 2023, what are you feeling? What's running through your head and your heart? Are you optimistic? Are you hopeful? Are you despairing? Are you full of doubt and worry, anxiety? Maybe your thoughts are divided. Maybe your heart is very divided about the coming year. I'm sure most of us are aware that the world is changing very, very rapidly. Even things that we once thought certain took for granted, some of those things are changing. Some celebrate these changes and some decry them. Felicia, I want to invite you to pull up that image uh, really quick. Whatever kind of change is coming, good or bad, right or wrong, change requires adjustment. It requires us to adapt. You'll notice the front of your bullets, and maybe some of y'all are thinking, what in the world is that all about? Some kind of typo? Did, did the printer go nuts? What happened? <laughs> maybe pastor went nuts. Um, it was inspired by this cover of the New York Times that I saw in the, um, the local coffee shop here in town a few days ago. And it says, we live in an age of destruction. That's exactly right. We do. And then, it, of course, the subtitle is, which means we live in an age of rebuilding. I'm a little scared, personally. Or not scared, maybe not the right word. Concerned about what we are rebuilding. But it is definitely an age of destruction. There is no doubt about that. And I was trying to kind of get some of that across in the cover of the the bulletin. I'm personally not terribly enthused about the changes. Maybe some of it's good, but I am hopeful. I will say that, okay? So as we go into the Word of God this morning, I will say I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for this lot here, this crowd here, because Vermonters in particular are used to adapting. Every winter, we all adapt. Some of you are like, wait a minute, he said we. He's not a Vermonter. <laughs> I've been here a while, but still don't fit the bill, I guess. But, but we, are, we are adapting. Those of us who have lived here for some time, we get the wood out, we get it cut, we get it stacked, we change our tires, our cars and trucks, we get our winter coats out of the barn, put the summer clothes away, pick up some rock salt. We do all of these things, right? And many more. This year, some of us got out our generators. Maybe some of us bought a generator. But when the weather is changing, you make preparations, and Vermonters are used to doing that. So I'm hopeful. You're used to positioning yourself in such a way that you can be successful when the change comes. Now, Second John is a beautiful little book that is going to help us do that spiritually this year. The Apostle John is going to give us some nuggets of wisdom that I hope will help us survive, position us to do well, and to respond to the coming changes, whatever they may be, good or bad, in 2023. And all that's up for debate, right? So now, having that, 
Having said that, I'll invite my wife, Megan Fords, to read from this short but wonderful little book for us. We're going to read the whole book, believe it or not. <laughs> Second John. Thanks, baby. It's possible. One book. All right. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have, have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him stakes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. The grass withers. And the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we pray as we come to the word. Again, I don't want to just go through the motions here and, and say a bunch of stuff. Lord, I want to speak truth and I want your people to receive the truth, Lord, and that takes help. It's not something that comes natural to us. We are naturally opposed to you, naturally opposed to the truth. Lord, incline us this morning to receive it, to want it, to thirst for it, to be able to apply it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this week as an interesting exercise, I took some time to explore what other church leaders might be doing to begin the new year. What are they talking about? What are they preaching on? I found a silly thread on Twitter asking for, quote, lame sermon titles that might be used for the New Year's Day service. Here's a sampling of some of what I found. Another year bites the dust. Hmm. Do your cameras have better resolutions than you? <laughs> 2023 or 2023 reasons to read your Bible, a 52 week sermon series. <laughs> new year, same God. Behold, I am doing a new year. Less of me in 2023. Why haven't you been to church since last year? <laughs> last year's resolutions take two. There were many, many others. Those are just a few notable mentions. While I laughed at some of those, I, you know, was kind of like, eh. There wasn't any one that was like, man, that's a zinger. That one's really, really, really good. The reason I think some of them, again, just some of them were slightly funny is because they will probably be pretty close to real sermon titles today in many of the pulpits across our land. And I don't know whether to laugh or to cry, quite frankly. So many pulpits are filled with this sort of what you might call fast food approach to teaching. With what could probably be better described as entertainment than real meat for hungry pilgrims on their journey to the celestial city. Just this week I saw a post on social media from a friend who declared publicly that they are walking away from the faith. No doubt, 
knowing this person, a, a wounded soldier, weary from the battle, had thrown up his hands in dis disgust and frustration. Probably give many reasons why. I reached out to him in a private message to see what's going on. But my hunch is that it's because Christians all around him are more interested in catchy sermon titles and staying on the up and up with the latest news than they are with actually walking with God. I resonate with that concern deeply, deeply. Our enemy has found a tactic that is very effective on the battlefield. We could talk a lot about those tactics, but one in particular that struck me as I was preparing this morning or for the message this morning was distractions. This is a tactic of our enemy. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, once said this, Satan will always find you something to do when you ought to be occupied with prayer and Bible study if it is only arranging a window blind. Give me something for him, for you to do. He'll give you something to do. Now, some Christians today, I think, are so distracted that, sadly, I'm not even sure if they know they're on a battlefield anymore at all. The Christian life is more of a big, fancy department store or vacation to many today than it is a battlefield, and that grieves me. And I think many of you probably see this as well. It's a deep, deep concern what that means in practice is that we've put down our armor. We've put down our spiritual weapons. We've gotten out our sunglasses and our lawn chairs and sunscreen, and we're just hanging out until Jesus comes to get us. We're more concerned about our bucket list than we are about being faithful to Jesus. But when we read the words of the Bible, what we find is battlefield language. Battlefield language. We read about deceivers. We read about the Antichrist. We read about those who've fallen away from the truth. We read about lies and liars. We read about loss and rewards. This is the language before us in 2 John. And it's everywhere in the scriptures. There is a spiritual war happening all around us. I was reminded of that fact when I read those devastating words from a friend online. I mentioned a moment ago, who said they no longer believed. We're in a spiritual battle. That post confirmed to me what I should say to you this morning. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. That's verse 8 right out of our passage today. Watch yourselves. There are so many snares and pitfalls all around us today. As we start the new year, fresh off our celebrations and parties, John is going to remind us of the war that is taking place all around. And he's not just going to remind us that a battle is taking place, but he's going to give us a few points about how we can make it through. But before we dive in, let me give you just a quick bit of background about what's happening here in this letter. Again, we're only going to spend this morning here in 2 John. But who is this elect lady? Maybe some of you are wondering about that as we start out. Who is this elect lady that John writes to here and why? Well, one trustworthy scholar writes these words, the elect lady and her children is a metaphorical way of addressing a local church and its members. He continues, this interpretation is the choice of most modern, reliable interpreters and is supported by many considerations. He goes on to give a number of reasons, but maybe the biggest clue is that throughout the letter, John uses the second person plural, you, in the Greek. Down south, we'd say y'all, right? <laughs> so John is not speaking to a woman. He's speaking to a group in this plural, you all, kind of fashion referring to the church. And that lines up with other places in the New Testament, even in the letters of John, where he refers to the church as a bride, right? As the bride of Christ. Like 1 John, this little letter that we call 2 John was probably written somewhere close to Ephesus near the end of the first century 
AD. Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. Ancient sources suggest John spent the closing decades of his life in this area. John would have been the last living, remaining apostle. He would have been an elder in the sense that he was older. He was a, not only a leader, but he was an older man than the other, many of the other leaders in the church at that time. But he was ministering to churches like those listed in Revelation 2 and 3. If you were to go and read about the churches there in that early, early part of Revelation, John would have been ministering to churches in that region like those there, again, in modern-day Turkey. John was writing because now some 50-plus years since Jesus had died, risen, and went back to heaven, a great many false teachers had begun circulating and were seeking to deceive the church. All kinds of people had popped up and began teaching false things about the Lord Jesus. He writes to call the believers to hold fast and continue in the way that they were taught. Don't deviate, he says. Stay in the way you were taught by the apostles. Now, as things continue to shift and move all around us in our world, probably feel, it, things feel like the cover of that New York Times magazine or the cover of the bulletin like the ground is moving and things are twisting and shaking and want things that we once took for granted even. As things continue to, to shift and move, I can think of nothing better for us to hear as we enter a new year together. This message of holding fast, stay the course, continue in the way you were taught, don't deviate. I pray this little book will help us as we start the new year together. Okay, John is going to give us a number of things to wrestle with here in this letter. But the clearest and perhaps the central claim of this little letter is the very simple command. Love one another. This very simple command right at the center of what John is going uh, to be saying or is saying to us. This teaching is so central to this little book. I'm hoping... Uh, where I'm going, excuse me, not hoping, I'm going to phrase all of the other instructions in light of it. And I hope it'll make sense as I go along what I'm trying to do here. So I'm going to phrase everything as love by doing X, Y, and Z. Okay, because that's so central to what he's saying. First, look with me at verses 1 through 5 right there. If you've got your Bible open or in the, in the bulletin or on the screen. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. That is my prayer for us. Nothing more I desire for this little church than that, that we would walk in the truth. Walk in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, dear church, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. There it is. We love one another. That was John's big message in the previous book, First John. If you were to take some time this afternoon, you could probably in 10 or 15 minutes work through First John. And you would see this is right in the heart of what First John is all about. It really comes through there, and also in John's gospel. In John's gospel, same writer of all these beautiful scripture books. Love one another. What do you think that means? What do you think that means? Well, some of us are probably reading that command, love one another, with our cultural eyes and hearts. You've defined it as, not as Scripture defines it, or God, or John, but how the world around you defines it. We probably define it in a way that the vast majority of our unbelieving neighbors would define it. I could go back here, over there, or out on the green, talk to neighbors, get a definition of love. And I would guarantee that some of us, perhaps, are defining love in a very similar way they would probably repeat you know these words back to us love one another yes that's important here here but what they mean again is very different from what john 
means here. Love is a completely ruined word in our culture today. Almost meaningless at this point. The word love has been so destroyed today that it means virtually the very opposite of what John intends. Let me read a passage to you out of a book that captures it so very well. Now, this was written over 50 years ago, but still captures what I'm trying to get at. This book is is titled, I Loved a Girl, and it's a record of private correspondence between two young Africans and their pastor. It's a a wonderfully well-written, beautiful little book. A young male, a professing Christian teacher, writes to this pastor and tells him that he slept with a woman and that his school subsequently disciplined him. He had lost his job and he did not understand why. So he's writing to the pastor for wisdom and understanding. Now listen to this. In the previous letter, this young Christian man had said that he had loved a girl. That was the phrase he used for sleeping with her. The pastor responds, one phrase in your letter struck me especially. You wrote, I loved a girl. No, my friend, you did not love that girl. You went to bed with her. Those are two completely different things. You had a sexual episode, but what love is, you did not experience. It's true, you can say to a girl, I love you, but what you really mean is something like this. I want something, not you, but something from you. I don't have time to wait. I want it immediately, without delay. It doesn't matter what happens afterwards, whether we remain together, whether you become pregnant. That has nothing to do with me. For me, it's right now that counts. I will make use of you in order to satisfy my desire. You are for me only the means by which I can reach my goal. I want to have it. Have it without any further ado. Have it immediately. This is the opposite of love. For love wants to give. Love seeks to make the other one happy and not himself. You acted like a pure egoist. Instead of saying, I loved a girl, you should have said, I loved myself and myself only. For this purpose, I misused a girl. End quote. Sorry, I know that was strong. But that's the way we define love today. We've got it totally backwards. Our culture's definition of love today is closer to that young man's definition than to John's here in the Bible. We've made it about ourselves and what we want, what we desire. John's definition is all about sacrifice and giving. It's about walking in the way of the truth. John here is frequently connecting the concept of truth with love. Look again at verses 1 and 2 if you've got your Bible open there. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. What John is basically saying here is that this community of love exists and can only exist because it is the truth that gave birth to it. This community would not exist were it not for the truth of Christ, what he's done, who he is. Love exists because of this thing called the truth. The clear implication is that without truth, there can be no love. And what is the truth? There's a lot to say about that, but Jesus put it succinctly. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the very embodiment of truth. And when we look at the life and the teaching of Christ, what we see is a life completely devoted to others, to giving, to sacrifice. The one who was truth embodied lived completely for others. But many of us define love in the very opposite way because we've been duped by our culture, a culture which is in the grip of the evil one, which says me, give it to me. That's what love is. It's about what I want. Give it to me now. Not just, you know, sexual love, all sorts of things. And if you deny me what I want or what I desire to believe or think is right, you hate me. If you don't affirm me in whatever I think or feel or do, you're hateful. That's the total reverse of what God says to us this morning. Today our world thinks that love is letting people have what they want and affirming them in that thing, whatever it might be. That's wrong. 
We are so very confused. But this is the trickery of the devil. He's so very sharp and cunning. Here's what he's done. He's taken words like love and filled them with different meanings. So now folks can quote love and claim to follow Jesus while doing literally the very opposite of what Jesus himself did and taught. But we're loving because we've redefined it. Do you see that? How tricky that is? How slippery that is? It's happening all around us. Do not be deceived, beloved. Okay, pastor, so what is it then? How are we to love? From here on, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a handful of ways John calls us to love. I'm going to rephrase the other commands and instructions here given by John and connect them with this central command of love, okay? So if truth and love go together, as John claims, then this is a perfectly legitimate exercise. Any truth claim can be connected to love, okay? So here's the first thing we can do this year to love. Love by walking in the commandments of Jesus. Walking in the commandments of Jesus. You see that right there in verse 6. And I want us to miss the fact, too, that, that we're talking about holding fast, okay? And we're staying the course. Love is right at the center of holding fast our confession, staying the course. But now we're talking about what that looks like, okay? And it looks, by, it looks, it looks like love. But what does love look like? Love looks like walking in the commandments of Jesus. Verse 6, this is love that we walk according to his commands. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Just as you've heard it from the beginning. Hasn't changed over time. Hasn't evolved. Hasn't been the telephone game. It's something totally different at the end of the line. No, just as you heard it in the very beginning. From John's perspective, you cannot love and walk contrary to the way of Jesus. Unless you redefine love, which again is what the culture is doing can't hit the target or we don't like the target so let's move or change the target and then call that the target that's what's happening we've redefined it even churches have redefined it and perhaps this is one reason why my good friend has abandoned the faith instead of staying to the truth as we received it we've fallen in love with acceptance and with the culture and now we've adapted and changed to become like the world The commandments of God have not changed. If you were to go back to the Old Testament and look at Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5, you would read about these things called the Ten Commandments. Right? You all know those. Maybe some of you have them memorized by heart. Maybe some of you do. That was the heart of the law or the commands. Jesus didn't do away with those. In fact, what he did was elevate them. He said adultery is not just a physical act. He said you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. Jesus elevated the commandments. This is the way of Jesus. What we find in the New Testament is that love is the fulfillment of these commands. So when you're walking in love, you're walking in the commands. They go together. Do you see that? That's the way of Jesus, and that's the way of love. So that's the first way. Be faithful to the commandments. Walk in the commandments. Second way we can do this this year, the hold fast. Second way we can love is by being watchful love by being watchful look at verses seven and eight for many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of jesus christ in the flesh such a one is a deceiver and the antichrist watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for but may win a full reward there is no more loving thing than you could that you could do for yourself or for others than to keep watch for them keep watch What this means is to be prayerful, to be alert to what is going on. But I want to submit that a part of what this means today in our technological information age is for you to watch less news. Watch less news. I plead with you, beg you to watch less news. Some of us mistake being alert and watchful for being informed, watching the 24-hour news cycle. No, that, that is not at all what John has in mind here. That's not being alert. It's not being watchful. What John is referring to here is paying attention to the spiritual realities that are happening around you. The news only shows you the results of the spiritual realities. 
we need to be aware of them before we see them in the news. The news is merely reflecting some of what we see in the spiritual realms. Be prayerful over your own soul, over your family, over your church, over your pastor, your leaders. Be prayerful over your community. One way you can be watchful, one way is to be in church regularly. Good job, all of you, <laughs> this morning. <laughs> Praise God. You get to hear the Bible taught, even when it's uncomfortable, right? I mean, I'm up here sweating. Last week I was sweating. It's hard to open the Word of God. It's hard to sit under the Word of God if we're preaching all of it, right, and trying to be faithful to it. But that's good. It's good medicine for your soul. We need this, do we not? We need it. Be in church. Hear the Bible taught. Rub shoulders with other believers. Pray, ponder, worship. The church gathering will help you do all of those things. Notice in verse 12 how John says, he would rather be with them in person and talk to them face to face. Did you catch that? Look at verse 12. Go ahead, open it up, look at it. Felicia, if you can pull it up for me, that'd be great. What's it say right there? Though I have much to write you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that your joy may be complete. complete. Or for modern purposes, John might say, you know, I'd rather not use Zoom. I'd rather not use, you know, Facebook Live or YouTube Live. Folks online, I still love you, okay? <laughs> right? I'd rather be there with you and share face to face. There is no substitute for that face to face, in person fellowship, worship, and teaching. Come to church. A third way you can hold fast this new year, a third way we can love, is by being a student of the Word of God. A student of the Word of God. Look at verse 9 with me now. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Be in the Word. Be a student of the Scriptures. Ponder it. Pray it. Practice it. You've probably heard the, uh, the illustration before about folks who identify counterfeit money. Have you ever heard this illustration before? The folks know how to identify a counterfeit by knowing the real McCoy really, really well. And because they know the real McCoy so well, they can see any alterations or changes. We cannot know when we're hearing false teaching or seeing it if we don't know the real McCoy, if we don't know the truth, if we're not in the Word, studying, praying it, pondering it, practicing it. This is one way you can express your love for God, for others, and for yourself. Get one of those Bible reading plans in the back, okay? Or maybe you don't need that. Okay, great. Read a couple of chapters a day. Start in Genesis and just roll right through. But be in the Word. I'd be happy to help you with that. Whatever that looks like, please be in the Word. That's the third way. Be a student of the Word of God. Fourth way you can hold fast this new year and love is by being wise about who you associate with. Be wise about who you associate with. This is hard. This is tough. This is tricky. I get it. We're small town folks. Everybody knows everybody. It's hard to say, I'm going to distance myself from this person. That's tough. But God says it right here before us today. Look at verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Somehow, it's hard for us to read this as loving. And that's, that gives us, you, you feeling that right now? How is that loving? Well, that's the influence of culture, people. Our culture has so convinced us that we have to accept people to love them. We have to receive them always, forever. We can't ever stand off and say, no, you've done wrong. I won't associate anymore until you repent, until you turn, confess what you've done, be made right, believe the truth. There's a place for that. I would say this is one of the most common ways that people are led off the path of Jesus is this way right here, by associating with folks that perhaps they should not. Now, to clarify, John is not talking about non-Christians here, okay? So hear me right. He's not talking about non-Christians. We'd have to leave the world. Go up to the, you know, we'd be translated from earth to heaven immediately. But if you were to go back and read in 1 John, you'll find there's this group that left the church. 
He says, they went out from us because they were not of us. And that's why they went out. And he's speaking the same way here. Don't associate with those people. People who claim to be Christians yet teach false doctrine and don't follow in the way of Jesus. Don't teach his commands. Not the ones they like, but all the things that Jesus said. John says you must keep your distance from folks like these. I think this is one of the big reasons why we in this church are wanting to leave the United Methodist denomination. Right? That's my heart anyways. I hope that's where you guys are. We're doing this together because the association is no longer helpful. There's false teaching. They've abandoned the way, yet they claim to be Christians. We need to leave. And that's love, right? This is a rebuke. This is a turn from your ways. Please. It doesn't feel like love. But again, that's culture. This goes along with the previous point, though. How can we know who the false teachers are if you're not a student? I think maybe some of us are more in tune with culture than we are the word, and that's why this all feels wrong. What's he talking about up there, you're thinking? It's because maybe we're more in tune with the pulse of the culture than we are with the pulse of God and with the scriptures. This is not easy, but it is vital. God thought it serious enough to include it here. Now remember, most false teachers are nice people. They're caring people. They're not walking around with t-shirts on that say, I'm a false teacher, right? Wearing devil horns. It's supposed to be funny. They look like you and me. Be careful, okay? Be careful. Love does not take part in these works and receive these people, okay? Finally, as we come into the new year, one way we can hold fast is by remembering the great truth, having heard all these really hard and tough things, okay? And I'm receiving these myself. I'm not preaching at you, okay? I'm, I'm here with you, okay? This is, we're in this together. So as we come into the new year, one way we can hold fast and love is by remembering the great truth that Christ is holding fast to us. He is loving us. He has loved us. We can love because he has loved us. We sang these words at the start of the service. He will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. John said as much in his previous letter in 1 John, we love because he first loved us. We hold fast because he is holding fast to us. If we want to obey that most important of all commands, love God, love one another. If we want to obey that central command, we must first remember that Christ loves us. And that love is not something we get to define or shape into whatever we want. We must receive it as it is offered to us in the gospel. His love was a certain kind of thing. It was a sacrificial love, a love that went to the cross and died for you and me. It was a self-giving love, a love that recognized and lived out the truth and died for the truth. We can love this year by receiving his great love for us. Believe it, receive it, abide in it in all the ways I've mentioned this morning. As we turn now to the table of the Lord, we will remember this incredible, hard love. We will literally touch it and feel it. It will be broken before us. That's love. A love that forgives and receives all who come to him in repentance and in true faith. Amen.